Okay, everybody, I hope you all are, have been enjoying our uh, sessions. Um, if you weren't able to attend the previous sessions, we'll have the recordings available soon. We're excited to have you join, for, uh, join us with this discussion on the FTA. A few quick housekeeping items. The session is recorded. You'll be able to access the recording and any slides that are shared on the Virtual Summit website following the event. So keep an eye out for those emails. For those of you who would like proof of your attendance as professional development, you can request an attendance certificate through the Greenlight Guru Academy. Uh, you can find instructions on the Virtual Summit website as well. Um, also, they'll be in the follow-up email that we'll be sending afterwards. So keep an eye out for that. Finally, this session will run for about 45 minutes. If any questions come up throughout the presentation, please ask in the chat in the right-hand side, um, and we'll get to as many of those as possible. So it looks like we already have a few greetings from France. Great to see you. And uh, yeah, definitely put your questions in the, the, question, the Q&A or the chat. I'll try to monitor both of those as we go throughout this conversation. So there are a lot of still lingering questions surrounding the FDA. When is the EUA ending? How is the FDA handling software as a medical device? Uh, what other deadlines and conversations are happening? Um, so we're excited to have you tuning in to this. This is one of our most highly anticipated sessions. So let's start off with some introductions from everyone. And I'll just give a caveat, you know, if we don't have the exact answer, because, you know, maybe the FDA doesn't itself have the answer to when the end of the EUA is, is you know, just, just what we need to know, this things like that. So let's start off with some introductions from everyone. Um, if you don't mind just telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, maybe your company and role. Allison, let's start with you. All right. Um, Allison Komiyama. Uh, I'm based in San Diego. I am the... VP of MedTech Innovation for RQM Plus. And what that means is we help medical device companies get through FDA, at least my team does. RQM Plus um, does a lot more than that. We do regulatory and quality uh, for global markets. Um, the background, I guess, that's most compelling, I'm a neuroscientist by trade, uh, molecular cell biology as well. I uh, worked briefly at FDA. Uh, Nilo and I are both former FDA. He was there for a lot longer than I was. Uh, but after that, went into consulting worked um, for my own company, acknowledged regulatory strategies for a couple years before uh, I was acquired last year by RQM Plus. So now we're a team of 600 instead of my team of 10, uh, but still doing pre-market submissions. We do a lot with FDA, pre-submissions, de novos, 510Ks, uh, breakthrough submissions, safer technologies submissions, uh, PMAs, IDEs, lots of acronyms. Um, and also a lot with SAMD and emergency use authorizations, uh, which is our topic today. So pleasure to be here. I love Greenlight Guru and all the content you guys put out. So thanks for having me. Excellent. Thank you for being here. Michael, I'll let you take it away. Thanks. Um, Michael Nilo. I'm the president and principal consultant of Nilo Medical Consulting Group. Um, I'm based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, similar to Allison, um, the, our company's role is to really help companies get through the FDA process on the pre-market side, but also post-market submissions, uh, maintaining compliance. We do have some uh, quality system development, um, especially in the design controls and kind of product development work. Um, I'm a biomedical engineer, a biomedical engineer by, uh, by education and specializing in mechanobiology. Um, I worked at FDA for about six years, uh, started in dental devices, but most of my time there was on the plumbing side of cardiovascular. Um, I also worked in industry for a company that also worked on those kind of devices, but I've been consulting for the last six years. Uh, we have now we're up to a team of about 15 people, depending on the day, because contractors. Um, and uh, we're you know happy to help anyone with questions. Um, all the acronyms that Allison already said um, we also do a lot of ad promo work for those of you in the software's medical device where you are kind of in that, are we a medical device or are we not? And kind of working on what you can say and what you can't say. Excellent. Um, well, thank you so much for both of you for being here. Uh, so I guess let's just go ahead and dive into it then. Is there, um, can you provide a status update on the FDA? I know this is one of the, the things that we discussed. Um, however you want to interpret that question, what are some things going on at the FDA that companies maybe should be aware of that maybe they haven't been paying attention to? And, and Michael, do you want to kick this off for us? Sure. I, you know, as always, uh, there's a lot going on at the FDA, but right now kind of still in the middle of COVID, but kind of starting to come back and things like that. One of the interesting things uh, that you may or may not know the FDA is starting to come back to the office, but the device group in particular is having some trouble due to uh, 
Furman um, at the office. Uh, you know, when you kick everyone out because it's quarantine all at once, sometimes that includes the janitorial staff. So they're kind of having a slow, uh, slow rollback. But um, I do think we're starting to see a little bit more interaction with the reviewers and kind of getting back to that um, in the office mentality, which I, as a re former reviewer, I think it's a place where it's more important than other places to be in the office often uh, for that collaboration and kind of armchair consult from people who work in different areas of science. So I'm, I'm excited to see that build back up within the FDA. Uh, Allison, do you have anything else? On yeah, I think along with that, I agree. I think having that community at FDA and being in the building was so valuable. I also think FDA is also looking at um, how they're going to embrace remote work. You know, a lot of our recent reviewers for submissions, I think one was in Iowa, another one was in Nashville, Tennessee, another one was in New York City, Austin, Texas. They're all over the place now. Um, either they've uh, been hired remotely and they've never actually stepped foot on the White Oak campus or they've moved since the beginning of the pandemic to be closer to family or what have you. And so the benefit I think is, you know, FDA lost a lot of people because if they wanted to leave the DC metro area, they had to leave FDA. And now there may be an opportunity to retain a lot of that talent um, and get, you know, experts from all over the US, maybe uh, international as well. So I, I'm excited to see how FDA manages that, I think it would be a big mistake for them to say, well, if you can't come back to the office, then, you know, we have to part ways. I don't think FDA is going to do that because they have such great talent right now um, that's all over the U.S. So, yeah, interesting. Okay, great insights. Um, maybe getting a little bit more specific as to things that are maybe directly impacting some of the industry. Any thoughts on the EUA? I know we mentioned that. Um, Allison, do you want to start off? What, what, what are your thoughts there? Sure. I know uh, Nilo has some more up-to-date um, intel than I do, but one of the things that FDA came out with um, in, well, actually, I can look at the dates. It was in December of last year. They did have a webinar on it. If you go to CDRH Learn, it's about the transition plan for medical devices that fall either within the enforcement policies during COVID-19, um, during the public health emergency, or for emergency use authorizations that were authorized during um, the health emergency. They haven't, of course, um, ended the public health emergency, but they have said, hey, this is a draft guidance. We wanted feedback by March of this year, so it's a little late to put your two cents in. But at this point, they're trying to finalize that guidance document to decide how they're going to bring devices back under enforcement, the ones that have either made it out under enforcement discretion or under some, I think there were 23 some guidance documents when they had the webinar they talked about all of the, uh, the devices that were due to either supply shortage or because of the emergency use authorizations were allowed to go to market. How are they going to roll that back in and what's the timeline for that? And so they did lay out a nice 180 day plan that they plan to implement, where if they state, hey, we're, this is the initiation date, within 90 days, you need to state whether or not you plan to remain on the market. And then within the next 90 days, you have to then decide um, to submit your pre-market submission. Um, FDA wants to be interactive and collaborative with that process. Uh, so the, again, the final guidance document's not out, but at least their, um, their current thinking and their roadmap is, you know, are in those two guidance documents. Yeah, just to add to what Allison just said, and there's not a whole lot to add because you did a good job. Um, the, um, you know, currently then just because those are still in draft, it is business kind of still business as usual as it was early when they started the EUA program. Um, you can still submit your EUAs uh, for review. Um, they are consistently updating that device shortage list. Um, I think yesterday N95 respirators actually came off the, um, the sh shortage list. So like you kind of have to maintain you know, pay attention to those lists and the the communication from FDA. Um, in preparation for this uh, this webinar today, I actually reached out to the Division of Industry and Consumer Education, or DICE, at FDA. It's a wonderful resource for anyone for any question you have. I highly encourage contacting them for a lot of things. Um, but just to kind of get their view on it, and they said, you know, continue to submit them. However, there is a, you know, you should kind of consider whether or not at this point can be considerate of whether or not you'll eventually want a 510K or a de novo or another sort of pre-market clearance for your devices. 
because this will come to an end and they are trying to start nipping, you know, start that process for certain product codes sooner rather than later. Um, so kind of make that consideration before going in. There's also been on a personal side, and I think Allison, you know, has a little bit of this experience as well. Um, certain divisions are starting to deprioritize EUAs based on that device shortage list. So, and things just this part of the pandemic. So your success rate may not be as high as you thought, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was that view of, hey, this is an opportunity. Everyone needs to jump in. The FDA is being, I would say, appropriately and doing a really good job of kind of trying to say, is this needed? Or is this a good idea that should still go through the traditional pathways? Because just because it's a really good idea doesn't mean it's an emergency use, you know, fits that emergency use part. So they may push you toward the traditional ways. That makes sense. Uh, Allison, I saw you come off mute. Did you have something oh, yeah. to add? Yeah, I was going to say um, a lot of the questions we get are, you know, if I'm not, if I have an EUA underway and they decide to pull the emergency <laughs> or the, the authorization, yeah, if, you're, if you have one under review and the declaration goes away, um, that means they can't offer you an emergency use authorization. We have seen the first like de novos for PCR tests. So there's a new product code QOF, which I guess has been around, but there's finally the first de novo for it and the first 510 k for PCR tests for SARS-CoV-2 infections. I saw a press release that there are some companies now submitting their de novo for serology tests. So we now are seeing some of the de novos get through. And so those regulations are being put in place. And then I anticipate there will just be a lot of 510Ks after that. So there's always got to be one company that kind of forges the path, puts that de novo in place, gets that regulation in place, and then others will come in and, um, you know, 510K off of that. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. I wonder if we could, before we leave this topic, um, and maybe we zoom out just a little bit, you mentioned the conversations that go on between the companies and the uh, the FDA. Um, can you comment on some of that and give some maybe not necessarily advice, but recommendations as companies are either trying to pursue an EUA or whatever they're trying to pursue? I know you all have conversations with FDA pretty commonly. Um, are there things that you can recommend or suggest that companies could do to be more successful in this arena? Um, and maybe we'll start with you, Allison. Is your question more specific to for EUAs in general or just for... I, I don't think we have to restrict it to EUA, okay. but how, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the pre-submission process is still alive and well. There were a couple of offices of health technology or OHTs that were rejecting pre-subs for a while. Um, I think that's slowly coming um, back to life. Um, OHT7 in particular, the ones that had all the IBD to, um, products going through under review under EUAs, um, they were just slammed. Same thing with all the you know ventilators and, that, and the reviews of those EUAs, it just really backlogs a lot of things at FDA. Um, so they are making it through the list. We have seen that there was like a 180 day extension to any hold letter if you got that, that's now been redacted as of July. So you now only have your, your set review time and you can't ask for that extension anymore. But the pre-sub process is really just the, the way if you wanna get that feedback. I mean, I'm, I'm not always the, the biggest fan of pre-subs if you don't feel like you need that interaction with FDA, if you really do feel like you have a path forward either within the 510K or the de novo pathway already. Well, if you have a de novo, you probably should do a pre-sub. But if you have a straightforward path um, that's, you know, that you have a solid predicate, um, maybe don't burden FDA with more pre-subs unless you have really solid questions to go and ask the agency. I think same thing for EUAs. If you have an EUA, they would like you to do a pre-EUA or a PEUA to make sure you um, that you haven't been deprioritized or that there is still need for your product. Okay, Michael. Yeah, I can um, echo Allison's comments there. And actually, you know, the last time we were on a panel, we kind of talked about the pros and cons of going through the QSIP uh, program. But um, I, you know, I agree with everything there. I also would add that you know, replug dice as a good like way to go through and ask just general process questions maybe find a contact within the FDA where a quick question is something that doesn't result, re, require a Q submission, which on the FDA side requires them to write a memo and do a lot of work where this could be, could have been answered on a phone call type thing. Um, in terms of successful, um, you know, having success, if you do need to submit, because that was part of your question, if you do need to submit a Q submission or a um, pre-EUA, 
it really is kind of no, to me, the one of the biggest ways to be successful is knowing your audience um, and knowing, remembering that they don't work for your company. I think one of the biggest places people miss is they don't explain their device well enough and they don't explain the need for it well enough. You want, you know, you're submitting this information. It's a gigantic package of paper to a reviewer who is typically a scientist, a biomedical engineer, a clinician, a nurse, statistician, something, you know, but so they're very smart, they're well-educated, but they may not be smart in your exact technology. So giving them the right background, the need, you know, and being excited about it, they're, they're not robots, they're humans, like get, you know, they'll be excited if you're excited, they're, that's good feedback. So um, really doing a good job of not only like what your device is, and but why it's there and why it's designed the way it is really goes a long way in that initial contact with FDA, which is what a pre-sub or a Q-sub is. And the other part is being really specific or productive with your questions. Ask a question that has an answer that will drive your next steps as a company. So that's really important on the Q-sub pathway. If you ask just general questions of what do you think, that may not be an action, you might not get actionable feedback from FDA. You know, be, you know, really consider it. Um, there's always, there's always a kind of a discussion of whether or not you talk to the marketing department um, when you, as a regulator, but it is important to talk to your, especially in this area, to talk to them because if they want to say stuff down the road, you need to know what kind of evidence you're going to need to be able to say that specific thing. So those kind of claims um, and test pathways and things that you can move forward with are really important in your initial interactions with the FDA. So those are the two kind of broad bucket areas where I would say there's, you know, you can get more success. Great. That's great advice. I really appreciate the detail specifically. And I love that you mentioned that they're humans and uh, um, yeah, they'll get excited if you're excited. Um, I'll take a quick moment to remind our audience, if you do have questions, use the chat or the Q&A um, section of Zoom, and we'll definitely put those uh, to our presenters, make sure they, they have a chance to comment on those. Now, if we shift gears from maybe the EUA, talk a little bit more about SAMD. Um, a lot of times, software's medical device companies, they sort of view themselves as unique within the medical device world. Curious what your thoughts are from maybe an FDA point of view. Um, any any thoughts on uh, how software is a medical device? If they have if if there are differences or or what what can you what thoughts can you provide us on software as a medical device? Uh, Allison, I, I, yeah, I don't mean to call you out every time. I'll, I'll, let's start with you. Yeah, <laughs> I can I can start yeah. it. Please, you know, we'll go, probably have enough here to go back and forth. I think okay. software as a medical device. Um, in general, but also especially through the pandemic with the just huge boom in telehealth type products has been, um, there's enough to talk about probably for a week. Honestly, um, from the FDA side, um, I think they've been doing a really, you know, putting forth a really strong effort to kind of keep up and catch up with just the amount of new, um, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, they created a whole digital um, digital health center of excellence within the FDA during the pandemic. Um, there, you know, with a lot of messaging that has come out and some of the um, programs that they're putting forward, especially on the AI ML, especially in cybersecurity, um, and especially just in telehealth products in general. Um, I think, the, you know, you can kind of, I, I, there's kind of too much there to kind of go through. Uh, one by one, but I, you know, I would search that digital health center of excellence. It's a good centralized resource for where everything is there. Um, I will say it's still, um, especially on the more, actually, especially on the wearable technologies and the um, machine learning areas, there is still, um, they're still developing policies. So it's not something that's, you know, it's not a knee implant. It hasn't been around for 40 years kind of thing. It is something that they are still, you know, the baseline of how to regulate these and how to continue, continue to regulate these. The policies are still are new or being developed. And I think my, you know, the experience of going through the FDA process with them is also, it's learning on both sides because it may be your reviewers or your review teams first, second, third, one of this type of thing, and it's a new application. So 
you know, it may seem frustrating as a device developer coming through this where it's so easy to change and update your software and the FDA process is slow. But, you know, just kind of remember that this is not a, you know, it's not an Excel spreadsheet. It's going to be out there to, you know, help affect the public health. And so there is going to be a higher level of evidence that you may be held to than you're than you want to do than you actually want. Um, so I think that's been a kind of a constant push pull for me and our my clients through this. Um, and you know, sometimes it's a little frustrating, but sometimes it's like you got to remember what you're there for and what you're trying to do. So um, yeah. Allison, you want to jump in with maybe some more specifics there? Sure. Yeah, we've seen a huge uptick, I think, in the last two and a half years in wearable technology, software as a medical device, software in a medical device, um, CAD-E, which is the CAD, um, computer-assisted de detection or computer-aided uh, diagnosis, sorry, computer-aided detection, computer-aided diagnosis, um, and also computer aid uh, triage, right? Triage as well as aided acquisition and optimization devices. So a lot of the radiology has been a big group that's seen the most of um, the CAD products. Um, and AIML is just crazy. Like I feel like uh, most of our, I used to say everything now has an app, right? Most of the devices we work on have some sort of app that's associated with it. But now it's like everything has AI and machine learning. Um, I'm actually going to put in the chat window FDA's database. It's super handy. You can see all of the devices that FDA has either approved via the PMA pathway, uh, granted via the DeNovo pathway, or cleared via the 510K pathway that have AI and machine learning um, enabled in those products. Um, I think there's 343 as of today, um, and they keep adding to that list. It's fantastic. So. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I put it. I only sent it to the, the panelists. Um, and, you know, that's a really great place to start to figure out what companies are doing, what sort of, um, you know, testing clinical evidence that they need to supply to add that feature to their uh, to their 510k, for example. The other thing is, and I'll echo what Nilo said, um, there's been uh, every year FDA releases a draft guidance document priority list, as well as a final guidance document priority list. Um, they came out earlier, or I should say end of last year, with the content for pre-market submissions for SAMD or SIMD. Um, it's draft, and so they have a different way of looking at um, what's going to actually need to go in your pre-market submissions. I recommend people still use the final guidance document uh, that was released previously, but once that one's finalized, that will be the new way of, that they're going to um, review pre-market submissions and that information they're going to want to see as part of your files. The other thing that I know is coming um, because it was in the priority or in the A list that FDA puts out for their guidance documents is marketing submission recommendations for um, change control plans for AI machine learning enabled devices, as well as the guidance for risk categorization for software as a medical device. And that's FDA's interpretation policy considerations. So those two guidance documents, I anticipate they're going to come out by the end of the year. And it's going to be huge for industry once those come out, because I think FDA has been relying a lot on. IMDRF for the International Medical Device Regulatory Forum. I think that's what that acronym stands for. Um, and a lot of the guidance documents that FDA has worked on um, with IMDRF. Um, however, it's going to be FDA's guidance now on you know, how they're looking at the categorization of SAMD, as well as um, some of the definitions. I think one of the things a lot of our clients run into and questions that we get is what's the difference between screening versus diagnostic versus monitoring versus, you know, all the definitions that it's like FDA. And we've noticed, you know, there's not, um, it's not totally consistent among the different groups, right? The radiology group may look at it different than the ophthalmic group. And so trying to understand, you know, uh, what FDA's collective uh, thinking is on um, some of those definitions is gonna be insanely valuable. So I really look forward to those guidance documents. Um, and of course, they'll have a comment period. So I recommend anyone who has any sort of digital therapeutic, digital diagnostic device that they're working on that maybe has AIML or has, um, you know, some stakeholder uh, uh, comments to add to those guidance documents, please do. Like FDA takes those very seriously and they address all of them uh, as they review the comments as they come in. Um, you know, was going to add just because as you know, as I mentioned, because there's so much going on in this space that you kind of, it's tough to kind of come around. One of the other things that with all these, especially wearable technologies, um, 
that there will be functionality on your device that is not medical, but there's also functionality uh, that is medical. And the FDA in, uh, I think about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, put out a good guidance uh, and that's like related to multiple function device products, policy and considerations. And when you go to the FDA, really defining what parts of your software is under the scope of FDA regulation versus what is not is really important because you you know you need to kind of point the light at what they're supposed to be focusing at uh, focusing on and they'll help you you know again Q submission program or even during a review will help you with these kind of things but it is you know your responsibility as a manufacturer to really define scope what you're trying to do and why and what is medical related versus what is maybe wellness related versus what is just you know function of uh time um, um and um and i apologize i will try to avoid um government alphabet soup <laughs> um and well i can go back and grab something um if, if i missed it at this point um, the other one that has recently come out and the FDA had a couple of webinars in July of this or June of this year was the cybersecurity um, new draft guide, and that is going um, that has been a pretty major effort from both the FDA and industry to figure out how best to both regulate that um, those threats for cybersecurity level and how you know where the burden of you know, regulation lies. Is it going to be in the pre-market? Is it going to be in labeling and kind of push to patients? Is it going to be in post-market plans? And that is, there's a lot to unpack there, but and those discussions are still happening. But if you are in cybersecurity, um, the sessions that were back in June were recorded. If you missed them, I would recommend going back to it. And like Allison said, when these draft guidances come out, and I, I have a feeling there will be more and kind of continually updated as this evolves. Um, if you're an expert in the field, make sure to comment on it. The FDA really does, you know, has to go through all of that and they appreciate it when it comes from a good space, a good or a good place. So. Yeah, and those guidance documents, um, from my understanding, the Patch Act is going to uh, that that is sort of going through right now is going to give them a lot more teeth than maybe some people had perceived them to have in the past. So yeah, very good. Very good uh, recommendation to go back and look at those and add, add your comments as industry professionals. Um, I I don't know if it's unique. Uh, it feels like it might be unique to software as a medical device, but it feels like the medical device industry has a lot of you know software or developers coming in who are new to medical device. So it's kind of a, a, a new space for them. And so software as a medical device with all the influx of uh, SAMD specifically, it's really it's really been a huge rocking the boat moment, I guess, for lack of a better word. Allison, yeah. did you want? Yeah, yeah. I was just going to um, agree with Michael. But FDA keeps asking for, you know, really draw a box around what is your device? Because I, I think that that multiple functions guidance document is very valuable. I mean, I think it's also use, uh, useful as like a general use guidance for even devices that may have um, hardware functions and software functions, really trying to parse out, you know, if there is a MDDS, which I'll explain what that is, a medical device data system. So if you're essentially sending something to the cloud or sending something to um, to the device through Wi-Fi, what is, um, you know, is that part of the device that FDA should regulate? And, um, you know, that's up to you, I would say, to make the argument, make the case of where your device begins and ends and make sure that FDA really understands what it is they're regulating and what, did, what it is they're not regulating, right? Because if you wanna make changes to those components that are not F, regu, under FDA regulation, then you wanna make sure that FDA doesn't, you know, that they understand your device completely, they understand where the bookends are of your product and that they understand that an inspector then coming into your um, company and doing an inspection later on knows that, hey, only this part is really considered under FDA oversight. Um, I think it's really important for uh, FDA to, you know, it, it's important for them to do their job and you want to make sure that you're not giving them extra burden by saying, hey, we're not going to be totally clear with our device description. So I think there's a lot of guidance out there. Mobile medical app guidance is uh, really valuable. Um, there's also a lot of uh, examples in that guidance document is what FDA wants to enforce and what they don't want to enforce. Um, 
So I, I would say make sure you understand what guidance documents are out there. You know, there's a, a nice database that you can search for that. You can, um, you know, call Michael or myself up and we can help you, you know, point you in the right direction. Um, but you want to make sure your first interactions with FDA, whether it's a pre-market submission or pre-submission, is very educated. And um, at times it's good, especially if you're dealing with brand new reviewers, that you're kind of learning these things together, but you want to make sure that you come in well prepared and that you've done your research, done your homework, um, and, and that FDA understands what you're trying to accomplish. There is a question in the chat uh, or in the, the Q&A section. Radiologic AI seems to be ahead in standardizing how to validate AI-supported functions. Will their learnings be shared for other areas of medicine, such as pathology? Um, either one of you want to comment on that? Gosh, I hope so. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think there is... Um, sorry, I, my phone. No, no. Okay, I... Um, you're totally right. Whoever wrote that comment, I feel like radiology is, um, they had, it made the most sense, I think, for things to really kick off in that group, right? Because uh, to take images and to analyze them, and if, especially if it's thousands of images and trying to either isolate an area of interest or to show changes over time, like that's really hard for any physician or human anyone to do. So I think that um, it made a lot of sense for there to be uh, that, you know, that technology to really take off in that group. I do know that the uh, Digital Health Center of Excellence that we keep talking about, uh, they are trying to, to make sure there's consistency along, around all of the OHTs, all the different offices of health technology. Um, and then they're sharing, you know, what did we do over in the um, radiology group and how do we transfer that to the neuro group, to the ophthalmic group, to the urology group? I mean, there's uh, uses for these devices everywhere, right? Or uses for these um, technologies throughout medicine. I think one of the things that I'm really excited to see if, if it's in the guidance document is how FDA is going to manage um, predetermined change control plans or PCCPs. I think there's gonna be a new name for it just based on the, the guidance document uh, that they proposed. Um, but really understanding what it is, what, what can you change about your product or about your algorithm without having to do a 510K every day, every minute, right? If you think of something that's um, that machine learning, if it's constantly learning and hopefully constantly improving, then uh, you're changing the device, right? And historically, FDA would say if you're changing the performance of a device, that would fall under the MODS guidance documents, which is when to submit a 510K for a change to an existing device or a change to existing software. And if you have to submit a 510K for every time your device makes an update, um, that's, that's wild, right? And extremely burdensome from FDA and from industry's perspective, right? So there are currently no adaptive AI devices that I know of that have been cleared or granted or approved. There are locked algorithms, but FDA is open. And there have been a few cases where FDA has either granted or cleared products that have a predetermined change control plan as part of their submission so that the company can say, here's how we plan to update the device or here's the, um, and, and the, the controls that we're gonna put in place to make sure that it's actually improving. That, you know, we, we don't get machine learning in a bad direction for lack of a better term, right? You don't want it to start learning and um, you end up with a device that's, not even substantial equivalence, it's inferior to what you got originally cleared or granted. So it's pretty exciting to understand how FDA is going to continue regulating that um, without adding burden to themselves and to industry. I, I would, to that, the, the question of um, the radiology group kind of being shared around, um, just for the, you know, the listeners, you know, the FDA, um, especially within the Office of Health Technologies group, which is the pre-market review group for these, it's not as big as you might think it is. And, you know, they do share a lot of information, but be proactive if it's in a queue submission or something like that, you know, bring up that this has been done, similar has been done before in a different indications for use. Because I will say that, um, you know, as we mentioned at the beginning with uh, remote work and things like that, and just, you know, honestly, um, resources at FDA, they've been really burdened through the pandemic and, you know, have had, especially also with Medufa not being re, re -upped, reauthorized yet, you know, backfilling all those people, there's a lack, you know, they're still trying to keep up. So, you know, help them, help them help you, 
kind of do some of that work for them and present it to them and don't, you know, I think it's appreciated when it's easy um, as well. And yeah, that was the only thing I'd add to what Allison's good response there. Okay, great. Um, so the, if we, uh, there was actually one other question that I wanted to, to hit. This one's from Richard. What trends are the speakers seeing on when the FTA is happy to use the enforcement, enforcement discretion path to market for software as a medical device? Um, I'll take this one first. And Allison, you may actually have different experience here. Um, I, um, my kind of, as, as a former reviewer, the FDA is often a hammer and everything they see, it's kind of a nail. So if you present something to the FDA, it's their natural inclination to want to regulate it. So um, if it is not already in a guidance or regulation as enforcement discretion path, I think that, you know, or if you bring the, them that question, is this enforcement discretion or are you regulated? I would say that most of the time you're gonna land on, they wanna regulate it. I mean, that's their job to regulate and it is their job to kind of review and protect. So it is, I would, I would say it's difficult when you ask an FDA person to say, for, to have them tell you within the review division specifically, no, we don't regulate that. However, kind of the whole purpose for separating out the Digital Health Center of Excellence is to answer some of those questions on a less at a reviewer level and more on a policy level. So if you are kind of want, want or need to ask that question, I would reach out to them first as opposed to your specific review division because that's where you will get more policy-based answers directly as opposed to the safety and effectiveness-based answers, which is kind of more on the OHT job as well. Did you want to add something else? Sure, yeah. yeah, for, I mean, the ones that I've seen for um, FDA, I, I don't know if I'd say they're happy to use enforcement discretion, but they're, they're open to using enforcement discretion. Um, you know, especially for some of the COVID or the cognitive behavioral therapy devices, for example, for uh, there's a guidance document that came out for the use of those devices for psychiatric disorders during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so FDA released um, a few guidance documents that would be, that FDA essentially allowed for enforcement discretion for certain products that would typically be regulated as class two products or require a de novo. Um, they're still regulating those devices in the sense that if you want to submit a pre-market submission, they will review it and they will make a decision. However, um, they really saw the benefit risk shift in COVID, right? So if you had somebody who's no longer able to get therapy or go to see their doctor on a day-to-day -day basis, people were stuck at home, people lost their jobs. So I think, uh, you know, the PTSD, depression, suicidality rates skyrocketed. I mean, the uh, opioid and epidemic just also um, tripled. I mean, it, it's pretty harrowing. And I think in those cases, FDA uh, was very open to using enforcement discretion if it was going to provide benefit to the patients, you know, being able to get some sort of support or help or, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy or, um, yeah, some sort of support either through a tablet or through their phone or through telehealth um, and, and, you know, that I hope will stay in place. You know, I really, I see FDA is opening that door to kind of experiment to see, um, experiment's not the best, the right word, but to really see if this could be something that um, doesn't have to be so strongly regulated. Um, and so we'll see how FDA decides. We go back to the earlier conversation of transitioning out of the EUA uh, or out of that enforcement discretion. I think the other place I've seen it is, you know, for some of the mobile medical apps, you know, if really you don't have a medical device, like I, uh, sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of jump into the next question as well of when, like, how do you decide if you actually have a medical device? Um, and I would go to the definition of uh, what a medical device is, you know, uh, the Food Drug Cosmetic Act, um, section 201H. There's also been an addition to that that talks about software, um, really understanding if you have a product that needs enforcement, right? Don't go to FDA and say, hey, we think we're a, you know, a class three PMA uh, or a, a device that needs um, strong enforcement. If actually there maybe is some of the language or some of the, the claims that you can uh, tweak uh, and 
get to market and the FDA, you know, would say, as soon as you want to cure, treat, mitigate, diagnose something at that point, then we want to regulate you. So, um, you know, do your research again, uh, make sure that you actually fall within that, that um, enforcement policy. And if you don't, then you're, you know, get ready for the right submission you need to send in. Yeah, great. With the last few minutes that we have left, and um, I wonder if we could just I'll just put the question to you guys, more of a general general question. Are there any else, any other things that we need to be aware of from the FDA? Any other things that are going on that would be beneficial for uh, companies to, to understand? Yeah, um, okay. um, yeah Allison, I'll yeah, go ahead. I was, forgot to mute myself. Um, E-Star, everyone's talking about E-Star. <laughs> so, um, and hang on, I have the, I have it up on my screen because I, I, wanted to talk about it. ESTAR stands for the Electronic Submission Template and Resource. Uh, it is the new template that FDA has put out for, um, currently it's for 510Ks and de novos. They plan to go and turn this into a template for PMAs, pre-submissions, you name it. Any type of submission that's going to go to FDA will hopefully have some sort of electronic template that you can fill in and then electronically submit to FDA. Um, it's under pilot program right now, but I do anticipate that FDA is going to make it a requirement sooner than anyone expects. So uh, if you have a 510k or a de novo, it doesn't take away the fact that you got to do the right testing and do the right <laughs> summaries and, you know, make sure that you're putting everything in that template that needs to be in there. Um, you know, so don't, don't give FDA TMI, which stands for too much information. Uh, so make sure you're putting the right uh, documents within that ESTAR, but it's a have an incredible resource. I've, um, I don't know, it, it's also just very, very helpful. It has, um, you know, specific product codes. And also if there's some test or some guidance document that maybe is from like 1997 that you didn't know, but when with a certain device, it'll pop up and tell you that you need to follow this labeling guidance or whatnot. So um, it's, it's a very valuable tool. Um, they keep updating it. So every couple of months, there's a new release. And um, yeah, I, I'm really excited to see where that program goes. Excellent. Michael, what are your thoughts? Um, I, you know, echoing the eStar program, I've used it, even when I haven't used it to submit things, I've used it as a checklist because it is still a little finicky as a PDF to kind of navigate. It's, you know, kind of, especially if you're up against the deadline, you have to get something in, it might be, but it's definitely just a, a very good resource that the FDA has put out. Um, I did actually see um, a question in the Q&A that I wanted to answer briefly uh, related yes. to um, whether we can ask about de novo versus 510k during a Q sub. And Let, let's actually read the actual question just for everybody yeah. so they can say, can you use a pre sub for de novo to ask FDA's input on the classification for your product? Yeah. So it's an interesting question. I also wanted to get Allison's response on it because within the FDA guidance of um, for Q submission programs, it does say you can ask about potential regulatory pathways within a Q submission program. Um, however, if you want a definitive answer, you have to go through a 513G. That's kind of the official stance. And, uh, you know, the Q submission program is a more interactive program. So there are good ways to ask that question without directly saying, please classify our device. Because if you do that, the FDA will say, well, this is not the avenue for that. Please submit a 513G. However, you know, you can discuss potential predicates. You can discuss, you know, the potential of it being a de novo because of um, areas where um, the FDA has previously stated no predicates exist. Actually, um, a lot of these emergency use authorization guidances kind of have some of that information in them of, we've never cleared a product that does X, Y, or Z. Therefore, you can kind of use that as a, FDA has said this, does that mean that this kind of device would likely be a de novo? But um, the, you know, if you need an official written response that is, you know, letterhead and that kind of thing that says you are definitely one thing or the other, you'll likely have to go through the 513G program. But I would, and I think me and Allison agree there that there are ways of ut utilizing the Q submission program to be able to read between the lines and get the answer you want. Right, and if you have a uh, response, that's fine. Also, we have another question, um, if not, so. No, that was great. 
Okay, Christian, Christine asks, the ESTAR program states it's not currently used for combination device, but will it be? And should a combo combination device or combination product company use the program regardless? Um, it, you're right, it's not currently available for combo products. I think it will be maybe eventually, but that's a really hard one to template if you think about it, because there will be one program or one um, center whether it be devices, drugs, or, or biologics, that's going to have jurisdiction of your product. Um, so the template would really have to be, it would have to address both the group's review of the, the combination uh, of the two items or multiple items. So I think maybe, but I think that's gonna be a long-term goal of FCA. Um, it's probably not gonna be as prioritized because there aren't as many combination products that are submitted. I think if you have a combo product, that's like a wound care dressing or something that's historically uh, reviewed as a 510K with the Center for Devices, then absolutely you know, use the, the template, um, use the ESTAR 510K template for that. Um, yeah, did you have anything to add, Nilo? Yeah, I, I would say I fully agree. And I would say we're more likely to see an ESTAR type thing for the request for designation or RFD. Yeah. where it tell, tells you exactly what you need to put in each of the, you know, because that's got a limit to 15 pages as well. So, and that's um, request for designation is the pathway to determine who's going to be the lead for your combination product. Is it going to go to the biologics group? Is it going to go to the drugs group? Or is it going to go to the devices group? And therefore, which timelines and costs and things are, we, are you going to fall under? That's the RFD or request for designation pathway. Okay, so we had just a few other questions. We're at time. Um, let, let's let's go ahead and just do one more. But can we ask at FDA about a potential breakthrough device designation and application in a pre-sub? And then if you have a quick answer, and then we'll sure. go ahead and take. <laughs> you can. Um, I would say the successful question that you can usually ask about breakthrough is. Does your device appear to, you know, have, is it for life threatening or irreversibly debilitating disease? Uh, if you say, is this likely a breakthrough? FDA is just going to come back and say, well, submit a breakthrough application and we'll review it and let you know. Um, but if you ask about the indications and whether they're appropriate for the breakthrough program, that is something I think in the breakthrough guidance document that they say you are allowed to go and ask, or I think it was in their webinar. They said, sure, you know, like you can ask that question as part of a, a normal pre submission. Um, just know that FDA has not been very forthcoming with, you know, saying yes or no. It, it really comes down to you need to submit that type of file to then get that um, that address. I saw there was a pre um, uh question as well. I wish I had more time to talk about it because there are updates to that. Maybe Richard, feel free to <laughs> reach out to me. I'm happy to, to talk to you about the pre serve program. Okay. Um, thank you all. Really appreciate it. Um, both of you so much for your expertise and you're willing to share that. We are at time. Thank you all for joining us. The next session will be starting shortly. We'll be joined by two EUMDR experts to discuss the key strategies you need to nail down your EUMDR plan. So thank you all. Have a good rest of your great rest of your day and uh, stay tuned for the next session. See you all. Thank you. All right. Bye.